Hello, I'm Pete Zielinski, an editor with Modern Machine Shop Magazine. Welcome to Easy CNC with Cinumeric Operate, Part 1, Shop Mill Setup and Programming, an instructional webinar from Siemens. This webinar will step a novice user through setting up a three-axis milling machine, creating a part program through the Shop Mill programming option, and verifying the program within the control's built-in simulation. Our presenter is Siemens East Coast Dealer Support Manager, Chris Pollack. As Chris speaks, please feel free to ask questions. To submit those questions, use the question pane at the right of the screen. We'll receive those, and at the end of the presentation, we'll answer as many as we can. Chris, if you're ready, please begin. I am all set. Thank you very much, Pete. So, uh, as you see here, we're going to spend a little time today talking about shop mill setup and programming based on the Cinemeric Operate system. My name again is Chris Pollock and I'll be your presenter for today. Just wanted to give you guys a quick second here to maybe record some of my contact information. Anybody that has any questions uh, from here out, by all means feel free to get a hold of me. You can either call me on the phone or shoot me an email. My email, as you see on the screen, is chris.pollock at siemens.com. So what I wanted to do initially is to just talk quickly about this three-part series that we're putting on for Modern Machine Shop. Um, obviously, the first one today will cover uh, basic three-axis milling. So we'll go through moving a machine around, setting some offsets, going in, creating a basic program, and even going as far as looking at it in an auto type of mode. Part two, we're going to do the same style of format, but we're going to cover turning. So in part two, we'll go through setup and operation of a turning system, a basic two-axis lathe. And then in part three, we're going to revisit milling, but we're going to start to talk about some of the other areas within the system. So yes, we have shop mill conversational program, but we also have a program guide, which is a G-code style system. We can support CAD CAM, and we also have an ISO compatible mode. So we'll talk about all those four different modes. We'll do a, a common sample between all four modes and it'll show you kind of the continuity and fluidity of the control and how you can leverage it in multiple applications. So first I did want to just take a quick second and talk about our two primary control systems and explain what we mean when we say Cinematic Operate. Cinematic Operate is the actual software that is hosted as far as the user interface section on the control. The software, the software system is standard in either the Cinemark 828D solution line control or the Cinemark 840D solution line control. With that being said, um, as far as an end user is concerned, uh, once you learn to operate, you can kind of segue between either platform um, to briefly talk about the difference of the two platforms. It's really just more of a hardware restriction. The 828 is designed to be up to a 4 plus 1 configuration. That means that you can machine in a milling variant up to four axes simultaneously and position a fifth axis, where when you get to the 840, this is our highest level control. That is a full five axis control. You can control up to 31 axis, multi-paths, and is a very high end, robust, versatile control. The nice part about knowing that operate works between both platforms is you don't have to worry about well, if I learn the 828, can I run an 840 or vice versa? It's the exact same system. So what you'll see here is independent to the control. It's the exact same scenario in either one. So a simple overview here, um, talking about kind of what we're doing here. We're going through basic setup of a three-axis milling machine. Once we set up the job, we'll go in and do a simple conversational program or a shop mill program. Then we'll do steps to evaluate whether the cutter path mode that we've given it is correct, and we'll even simulate it in a virtual automation mode. This is going to be the sample we're going to use, and I'll, I'll toggle back and forth to this, um, this way you guys can keep seeing what we're going to kind of machine here so you have some reference. Uh, the intention is to go through some of the basic cycles. So um, just looking at the basic part, what we'll do is we'll face off the top of the part. We're going to go in and we're going to drill a bolt hole pattern. Then we're going to go back and we're going to mill the counter bores that you see there. Those are three corners diameter counter bores. And then we're going to also take a tool and we're going to profile around the outside of the shape. And intentionally the part is non-symmetrical so I couldn't use a basic can cycle. I had to do more of an irregular shape. 
So the first step or the first area we're going to talk about is our jog mode. And jog mode is the area where you're going to use to manually move the machine around and set up our offsets. Within jog mode, you have a basic TSM screen. This TSM functionality you're going to use a lot. You're going to use that to do tool changes, fire up the spindle, maybe fire up some additional M codes like flood coolant or mist flip on work coordinates, and the TSM screen was designed to really give you all the common functionality you would do in an MDI type of interface, but without you needing to know or learn true G-code functionality. Um, the system does have MDI, um, you just don't need to use it, you can run a lot of the common functions that you do outside of that through screens like this TSM. Then we go in, we talk about setting a work coordinate. We're going to measure some tools and just go through the basic interface. From there, we're going to segue over to our offset table and talk about how you create tools within our systems, maybe a few of the things that make us a little bit more unique to some of our competitors. And with that being said, we're going to segue over to a live demonstration of doing jog mode and our offset table. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to launch up what we call SinewTrain. SinewTrain is a control emulator that runs on a PC. Um, it's more than just offline programming because it actually mimics the front panel of the machine. So here if you look at it on the bottom section, that would be all physical keyboards on key, keys on your front panel. Same thing with the overrides, the cycle start. All this functionality can be utilized. I can change my spindle overrides, you know, grab the knob, move it up or down. So this allows you to do a little bit more than just offline programming. You can actually emulate and use it as a training tool when you're teaching somebody how to use the system without having to be right on the machine tool. So the first screen you see when you power up the system is the screen you're looking at now. It's the jog screen. I know I'm in jog because in the upper left-hand corner it tells me I'm in jog. So first step might be, well, I come up to jog. I want to move the machine around. There's two basic ways to move the machine around. I can select with my axis selector and use my plus or minus keys to jog the machine. Or if I had a hand wheel, I could use the hand wheel interface to move the machine around. In this case, with the simulator, obviously I don't have a hand wheel plugged in, so I could just use my jog pad to physically move the machine around. With that being said, what if I need to load up a tool? Maybe we want to uh, edge find a part, which would be probably one of your most common methods of doing a setup. Well, what I can do is I can go to my TSM screen, like we talked about briefly. Within TSM, our first option is for doing tools and tool changes. Then I can fire up my spindle, maybe define a direction. So let's say we're going to go grab an edge finder. So within this, I get in the upper right corner a select tool button. And what select tool will do is it's going to bring you over to our offset table. And the offset table we're going to look at a little bit more in the future. Here is basically my tool magazine, or all the tools I have available in the system at this time. So if I scroll down, we see I have an edge finder. Edge Finder I pre-created, or I could have created it right here at this point. Once I highlight it, I simply click In Manual. It's going to fill out the tool name, and then I just hit a cycle start. The machine's going to go up, change the tool. Immediately, I'm going to see in the right side of the screen that now the Edge Finder is loaded into the spindle. You see that potentially some offsets may have changed, especially if there was a tool length offset, maybe loaded for that tool, and it's ready to run. Next step might be to start my spindle. So here I would go in, maybe I want to run my edge finder at 1,000 RPM, and I'm going to find a direction using the select key, clockwise, counterclockwise, positioning. Um, any Siemens equipped motor on a machine is a full axis, so it can be positioned as well as run in a velocity mode. So we're going to run it in a clockwise direction, and then just hit cycle start. From here, my spindle starts up, in this case at 1,000 RPM. My override would apply, so if I slow or reduce or increase my override, you'll see my spin will increase or decrease, and it's even showing me my feedback from my encoder. So once the spindle's functioning, then what I can do is I can start to use some of my horizontal soft keys to be able to set up my part. So first, we have a basic set work coordinate. This allows me to come in and just simply get to a given axis and say I want to establish this to be a zero. Now what's going to happen is once I select that zero option, it's going to feed that offset into whatever work coordinate is loaded at this point in time. So if I select Z equals zero, it will not only zero out the display immediately, it doesn't require me to reload the work coordinate, and 
I can continue on moving, moving, moving around another axis or whatnot. So, you know, say for argument's sake, I was to jog the machine around, and I wanted to set up a Y zero, I could do that and just set Y. From there, let's say we wanted to do something a little bit more intricate. So, like in this scenario, if I was to look at my part, <coughs> excuse me, you'll notice that um, probably the simplest thing would be to work from the center of the stock as zero, zero. So let's say for argument's sake, I needed to, I had a blank, we're going to machine this to four, and four by four as a final size. So let's say it's four and a quarter inch stock and I wanted to find the, the center of the part. So with that being said, we can go into our measure workpiece function and now I can either do simple edge kicks or I can get into more complex routines like finding the middle of a block. So to give you a scenario real quick, what I would do is I would first follow the example in the animated elements. That's where I see this little tool come over and touching the P1 point. So that's what you would do on the machine. I would jog the system over until I physically touch that edge. And then I would save the location by clicking P1. Once I've set that value, you'll see that now the orange field goes to P2. So I'm simply going to jog the machine. In this case, obviously, I would come up a little bit maybe bring it over, maybe come down, follow the process, touch the other edge, save P2. Once these two fields are blue, now the system has enough data to say, well, what do you want to consider the middle of this part? What value do you want? That's your X0. And I can put any number here. But let's say I want to establish it to be zero. All I have to do is hit set work coordinate. The machine will automatically do the math based on P1 and P2, taking into account the diameter of the edge finder as well, and set the center point for me. So with that being said, we have these measure workpiece functions that will streamline your setup process. I can you know, find the center of features, whether it be rectangular or circular bosses. I could find skewed corners if I maybe didn't have a vise that was perfectly aligned. So this way it would actually align the work coordinate system to that point. And I'm going to use that through any of these features. Now, we're doing this scenario with an edge finder. Let's say, for argument's sake, I have a 3D probe in the machine. Well, what's nice here is all of our functionality has an intelligence to it as far as the tool table and the, the way I define tools. So in this case, if I was to change to a probe, so now I have a probe in my spindle, you'll notice that when I go back to the measure functionality in the same mode we used, now my two buttons are grayed out. The system automatically knows once I load a probe in the system that it's an automated cycle. So all you would do is follow the diagram on the screen, position the probe somewhere close to the edge, and hit cycle start. The machine would start moving over until it makes the probe. Then I move the probe on the other side, cycle start, and it will do exactly what I did manually, but automated with the probe. And I can use that for any of our features. So with that being said, any of these functions that you get into in the measure workpiece area they'll be able to be used manually or with an edge finder with an automatic probe. Um, you could use an end mill if you wanted to bump it. It really doesn't matter. So it's not like you have to learn two different sections of the control. You know, one if I'm doing simple manual setups and another one if I'm using probing. The other area where you would set up some basic offsets would be in the measure tool option. And measure tool allows you to come in, datum a physical tool to a specific, whether it be workpiece or fixed point. Now I'm doing this in the manual feature. I could also do it in auto if I had a tool presetter. You'll notice we have full animated graphics to kind of step you through the scenario. Okay, so with that, those would be the basic steps I would take to start to set offsets in the control, measured tools. The next logical question would be, well, where do these offsets go? And what they do is they go to our tool table or our offset table. I can go into our offset table by selecting the offset button. Uh, the offset button is in the right upper hand corner manual panel keypad. By hitting offset, it puts me to my tool table. So whenever I do the measure tool offset, they would fill in the lengths here. Tool wear would be used if I'm adjusting, incrementally adjusting my geometry to my tool. And then work offset that would be where the numbers got applied when I sought the work coordinate. And when I look in here, I can see a number of work coordinates. The work coordinate number is kind of up to the builder as to how many he wants to equip the machine with. Uh, we support up to 99 offsets within work coordinate. Um, same thing within the tool. What you'll find is you're going to see the number of tools that correlate to the tool changer carousel. So in this case, it's emulating a 40 position. 
Um, one thing that's a little unique to us is we also allow you to sort of retain tools in memory if you remove them from the machine. So let's say for argument's sake, I have a simple um, cutter half inch here. And maybe I want to take that tool and I want to remove it from the machine. Well, I can do an unload sequence. And all it really does is it moves it down below the numbers of locations. So that means that the tool itself is retained within memory. It just understands it's not physically in the machine at this point in time. For creating tools, uh, it's really just a matter of houring to a given location, or you can do them in an unloaded state. You select the new tool feature, and then you see all the different tools that we support. So we support, obviously, basic end mills, facing tools, twist drills, center drills. If you go into cutters, you can see some of the more complex tools that we support, bullnose, conical, uh, bevel cutters, tapered cutters, die sink cutters, all this type of geometry we support within the control, um, not only in a 2D orientation, but in a 3D full cutter comp orientation as well. Okay. So if we were just going to create a simple milling tool, I click mill, define some kind of name. So it's a cutter, 0.5 EM we'll call it. And now I have a given name. The length would generally get set by the measure tool option. I would define a diameter of the cutter. And then finally the number of flutes that my cutter has contains. Now, a lot of people get a little confused by the naming nomenclature within our system. Uh, we're all used to kind of having to create a tool as a given number. Um, what we've done is if you want to use number nomenclature, nobody says that you couldn't uh, just call this cutter number one. That's certainly, um, certainly fine within the system. But what we find is being able to give the system or the cutters physical names, you now can kind of track what the what tool you were using in a given program based on the name you called it. Um, the other thing it allows us to do is this is what the triggers our tool life management. So if I create multiple tools with the same name, it will associate those tools. So then when I establish a tool life to it, the system is smart enough to realize that, well, if I run out of the life of, of one tool, like that end mill I had, it will search your tool magazine, look for a duplicate tool, grab it, and continue cutting. With that being said, the magazine area is just used to kind of manage your tool changer magazine, um, whether you want tools to switch random or you want them to go to a fixed pocket all the time. And then the final would be your work offset area. Again, managing where your part zeros are. From there, why don't we segue back to our PowerPoint and start to talk about maybe creating a program now that we've kind of seen a little bit as far as setting up a tool. So first things first, when you're going to create a program, is you've got to get used to the program manager. And what the program manager is, is it's basically just the area where we allow you to manage your part program files. So it's an area you're going to come in, you're going to create new programs. Maybe you're going to maneuver programs from other devices, whether it be from a USB stick, a logical drive like a hard drive, physically on the machine, maybe a network path. Um, and all that stuff will be done within the Program Manager section. Within Program Manager, you can create directories, you can create different programs, like you see here we have Shop Mill, or Program Guide for our G-Code style programming. Now as well within that, we also have the ability of saving our setup data within Program Manager. So what that allows you to do is all that, that functionality we just set up within the tool table our given tools, our work offsets, I can actually save that data as basically like a little mini file and then bring it in. So you can now create tool libraries for series of jobs, family of parts, specific part, and bring that back to the control the same way you would bring the part program. All that type of functionality is done within Program Manager. From there, you would seg into, segue into the Shop Mill program interface. So shop mill is what allows me to come in through a user graphical interface and create part programs without having to know GNM codes. So here you see a couple of the basic screenshots. We're going to go into this in a lot more detail as we physically create an example. Some of the different cycles we support, facing cycle you see in front of you on the left. We have the contour editor that allows me to create irregular shapes. We're going to do that on this part. Then we segue from there into our graphics, and we're going to start to be able to simulate different portions of the job as we kind of step through it. 
within the graphics. You can do you know, full animation of the tool, so you're going to see the cutter physically come down and begin cutting. Um, we can go into cutaway views if we want to look in more detail at maybe internal features within the part. And with that being said, why don't we segue over and do a live programming demonstration of the system. Okay. So I jump back to see new train. And the first thing, like I showed you briefly in the PowerPoint, is going over to Program Manager. So just like we went into the upper right-hand corner and hit the Offset function, we're going to select the Program Manager, and that's going to launch us into Program Manager. So once you come in here, you're going to see three primary folders. Part Programs, and as you expand it, you can see some basic programs are written here. Sub-Programs, if there were any sub-programs within the folder, you would see them now. And then the Workpiece Directory. Basic intention is part program is just going to be an area where if you want to create a basic part program, you can come here, do it, and kind of intermix whatever part programs you want to have in the system. Now let's say you want to start to um, categorize those part programs, or at least uh, group them in different areas. Well then what you can do is you can create subfolders. Uh, no subfolders would have to exist within the workpiece folders. So both places, whether part program or work pieces, will store program files. Uh, work pieces is just the area that allows you to do it with subprograms or subfolders, shall I say. So with that being said, let's say we're going to go in and we're going to create a simple subfolder under work pieces. What I'll do is I'll select the new option on the right side of the screen. By selecting new, it gives me the option of giving it a folder name. So I'll call this one uh, Modern Machine Shop, and we'll call this Part one for our first part. Once you've given it the name, you don't have to worry about an extension, just say OK. It'll immediately create the folder for you. And the first thing it does is says, hey, do you want to create a part program possibly with the same name? So it duplicates the name. Um, if you're good with that, you can certainly just pick the type of program you're going to do, whether it be shop mill or Gco. In this case we're going to do shop mill. And then say OK and that will start launching our program. Prior to us doing this, I just wanted to talk briefly about Program Manager for a second. This is also where you're going to come in and maybe manage USB. So if you have a file that you want to bring into the control or one you want to um, bring out, you can highlight files, copy them, click on the device, paste them. If you have the system set up as a network, you'll get a network drive just like my logical drive here. In this case, my logical drive happens to be a spot on my hard drive but this could as well be a network drive. Um, we allow you to run programs from external devices, such as USB or networks or logical hard drives. So you can kind of treat these areas the same way you would treat the NC folder, which is just the, the normal internal memory. Okay, so with that being said, we're going to click back on my folder. We're going to click New, and we're going to create a new program, just like we were going to do before. So we're going to call this program Modern Machine Shop Part 1. Make sure that shop mill is selected. That will launch the conversational side of the control and select OK. Now when we first come in, the first thing we're going to require you to do or ask you to do is fill out a basic header page. The header page, for one, tells you which work coordinate I might be using, what the model looks like as far as for simulation purposes. So I can define my part to be a cylinder or a pipe, or a basic block centered, or a block with two opposing corners, or maybe hex stock. All of these functions are specific to simulation. They won't have any necessary bearing on the part program itself. So in this case, I'm going to do a block centered. We said that our part is four and a quarter by four and a quarter, so I'm going to define that. Top of the part will say that I want to take off a little bit of material, so maybe I'll tell it that I have 30 thou material on the top and the overall thickness of the block is minus one inch. In the example, if we look at the example real quick, we see that the four and a quarter will encapsulate the overall size of the part, and the finished thickness is 787, so the one inch will certainly give me something to be able to be clamping on. From there, once you define the thickness, the next step is defining the tool plane, which direction is the tool pointing in. Now, we're a little unique here. Um, we certainly allow you to leverage some more advanced functionality by flipping your plane. Most systems support G17, 18, and 19. Um, where a lot of controls start to stumble is once you're outside of the native plane for the machine tool, which in a mill is generally G17, once you start to flip to like an 18 or a 19, you'll find that a lot of times your can cycles don't function. 
So if I want to do a, a pocket mill, it won't work. Or if I want to use a drilling cycle, you'll also find a lot of times cutter comp doesn't work when you switch off the, the native plane to the machine. For us, any plane you pick it in, you can use full cutter compensation. You can leverage all of our can cycles, or regular pockets, whatever. The system will let you do anything you can do in the G17 native plane you can do in any other plane. From there, once you've defined the plane, you can also define where do I want to go when I'm done, a retraction point, somewhere in a positive value. Here I'm telling it to retract one inch away from the part on the top in Z. A safety distance, so as I wrap it down to the part, how close do I want to get to it with, once I start feeding. Whether I want to do climb milling or conventional milling. This gives you a good example of what we call our animated elements. Our animated elements are little animated help functions that kind of allow you to you know, understand what we're telling you this, a, a feature can do. So you'll notice as I flip from conventional milling to climb milling, my cutter path inverts. And I can see here I'm actually climb milling the part. And the final question is, when I'm drilling, I'm handling multiple planes, do I want to always retract to my retraction plane, in this case one inch, or do I want to let it come back to my safety distance? And then the system will manage if I have multiple planes or different spots in Z that I'm working from. Once the page is filled out, you're going to hit accept, and now you're going to see the program header is saved. It's saved as an event. So at any point, whenever you see this little arrow on the right side of the orange screen, that allows you to reopen that event and maybe make a change. So say for argument's sake, I knew I only wanted 20 thou material. You type into 20 thou, accept it, that saves that physical event. So you'll start to manage the program through this little editor area that you're seeing now. So with that being said, we'll use our horizontal soft keys to kind of create the part program. So what we do is we have a few options here. We have drilling. So if I want to do some drilling, which we'll do in a second, I would come to drilling and then pick the vertical soft key that defines the operation I want to do. I click milling. Milling allows me to do face milling, which we're going to do in a second, pocketing, multi-edge spigots, or what we call bosses, uh, slotting cycles, thread mill, all this stuff will be supported within the vertical milling cycles, engraving. I also have contour mill. Contour mill is where I'm going to go in to create irregular shapes. Once we've defined the, the events within the program, then we go over to simulate and we try it out. So what we're going to do here is we're going to face off the top of our part first. So I'm going to go to milling. I'm going to select face milling. Once I go into face milling, first question I'm asked is, what tool am I using? So from here, if I hit the select tool function, it'll bring me back to a quick reference of the tool table. If I want to go to the full table, I'll just hit tool list one more time, and it brings me back so I can highlight the given tool. At this point, if I wanted to, I could create a new tool. Um, just for time's sake, I created a, a few tools here for us to be able to use, to be able to work with first being a facing tool. So from there, you highlight the tool, you say to program, and it'll just fill out the tool for you in this page. Next thing we define would be feeds and speeds. Um, within our system, we allow you to program in inches per minute or feed per minute or feed per tooth. Uh, we allow feed per tooth because we know the number of flutes of the cutter and the diameter of the cutter. So there's some geometry we can do some calculations with. Uh, in this scenario, I was told to run this cutter at 50 inches a minute at an RPM of 2200 RPM. Once I do that, I'm going to tell it how I'm machining. Am I roughing it? Am I finishing it? In this case, I'm going to rough it. I can control the cutter path. So do I want to go bidirectional, unidirectional? Do I want to cut in the y-axis or the x-axis? All from just toggling these little fields. Then I define the corner of my stock. So if my total is four and a quarter, the lower left hand corner would be two and an eighth and two and an eighth over. Top of my stock happens to be 20 thou above. And then I have, in this case, an incremental move saying that the total length of the stock is four and a quarter inches from this x and y zero point. Where do I want to end when I'm done? I'm going to finish on the top of the part. What is my step over? Whenever we define step over, we allow you to define it as a linear distance or as a percentage. So in this scenario, I can tell it 50% of my cutter. Myself, I like to use percentage. This way, if I change the cutter diameter, 
don't have to remember to edit the program. Then we have depth of cut. So if I'm going to take it in one cut, just make sure your depth of cut is larger than the distance between the starting plane and the top of the part. And then if I want to leave finished material. Once you've filled out the page, you hit accept. The event gets stored, so now we see a new line of event. We can go to our simulation function and see what's going to happen for us. So when I first launch in, it's going to come into a 2D plane, see the cutter come across and start facing the part. I can look at it in a 3D orientation, start it, we can rerun it here, we can kind of rotate it around, we can go in and zoom into the part. All of this can be done while it's in motion as well. So if it's a lengthy program, I can start to move my window around during the animation process without having to, to stop or, or wait for it to get fully done. You can control the speed at which it physically verifies by going into program control. Here I can slow it down or speed up my simulation speed. From there, I get a pretty good idea that the facing cycle looks pretty good. So we can now jump back and continue on in our in our cutter path or in our program. So if you look over at the example real fast, we see that we have the uh, part faced off. Next logical part of the program probably will be to drill the bolt hole pattern. So I'll go in and drill these bolt hole pattern. Then we're going to mill the counter bore. Once we've milled the counter bore, then we'll go around and we're going to machine the outside of this shape. So if I come back over to our simulator here, our sinew train, next step would be let's drill some holes. So when I go over to drilling, we get a few different drilling options. First would be center drilling. So within center drilling, it allows me to really just kind of feed the depth and wrap it out. Um, where it gets a little unique is we can allow you to compensate either just positioning based on the tip of the drill or calculating the diameter at which you're drilling to. When you create a drill, one of the questions you answer, just like the few questions we saw in the, in the mill, you tell it the angle of the drill. With that, it'll know how deep to go based on that information. We can do drill reaming. Drill reaming is very similar to basic drilling, except if I pick reaming, it'll feed back out. Within that, I can position based on the tip of the tool or the shank of the tool. So on the shank, it's saying, hey, I want you to break through. So whatever the total depth is, go beyond it, whatever the calculated projection of the tip is. You can go into deep hole drilling, which is probably what we'll use for this scenario, and that allows me to peck drill or um, chip breaker. I have a boring cycle. Boring allows me to come in and either come down and do an orientation when I get to the bottom of the hole to pull off and pull out, or if I'm not orienting my tool, I can do a no lift. You'll see the cutter will come down, and then it'll just pull off along the wall of the part. And then finally, you have threading, which would be your tapping cycle. Tapping, we support either standard tapping or we support drill thread milling. So this would be a combo tool. In tapping, you can do single tapping or chip breaker, chip removal cycles. So if I want to start partial tapping, pull out, and then continue tapping, I can do that as well. Okay. But in this scenario, we're just going to drill some holes. So I'm not going to worry about spending the time center drilling. We're going to go right into a drilling routine. We're going to go into deep hole drilling. We're going to go pick the tool. The tool is a 3 8 drill in this scenario, so I'm going to highlight it and say OK. And then we're going to give it some feed rates and some spindle speed. Um, this one, I happen to know that we want to run this at 3 thou per rev. Now, when you're in a drilling routine, we allow you to program per rev, and I would just type in the value. RPM, I, uh, maybe I looked at the chart and I saw that I want to run it at 1500 RPM. Um, I can program constant surface feed as well by toggling this to surface footage. Am I going to do a chip breaker or a chip removal? So chip removal is going to pull all the way out of the hole, and then come back in. Chip breaker will just back up to break the chip. When we position, do we want to position based on the tip or the shank? So if I position based on the shank and I give it a one inch depth, I should get a, a one inch hole all the way through that one inch part. It'll, it'll break through by whatever the calculated distance is. My peck amount or my, my first twirl depth, say we're going to drop in at half an inch and let it peck from there. And then I can use my feed percentage reduction or my peck reduction to maybe decrement my peck if I get into a deep hole drilling scenario. 
I can reduce the peck as I get deeper into the cycle. How much do I want to back up? And then at the bottom of the hole, do I want to apply a dwell? Once you've filled out the page, you're going to hit accept, and you're going to see the event comes up. Now, this is a little different than face milling, because in this scenario, I need a little more information. So you see this open-ended bracket right here? That's saying I need a little more data. So with that being said, I'm going to give it some locations as to where I want to drill. So if you go to the positions section on the vertical soft key, we have a couple different ways to position drilling routine. I can give it a regular locations. I can do that either rectangularly or polarly. So rectangular would be just absolute coordinates. I can do arrays of holes, whether they be a um, single line array, a grid of holes, or a frame of holes. Or we can do a bolt hole pattern. We're going to do a bolt hole pattern in this scenario. We can do a full circle or a partial. We're going to do a full circle. We define the top of the, the drilling routine, so it would be Z0. We define the center. In this case, I'm going to use X0, Y0 as the center of our part the angle of the first hole, then we give it the radius. Now, in this scenario, it happened to have been dimensioned as a diametric value for my bolt hole pattern. So I can actually put in basic mathematics into my fields, and it'll do calculations for me. As well, if you hit the equals sign, you can bring up a calculator within the system and do more complex calculations. You tell it the number of holes. We're going to do five holes, not 55. How do I want to position between the holes? So am I going straight, or am I following the radius of my bolt hole pattern? We'll just go straight. Once I filled out that page, and I hit accept. Now you see that the two features kind of link together. It means it has enough information. So if I was to simulate it, you'll see where it'll now come across the part and drill my holes. I can go to a top view. If you were to look at maybe a side or a front view and rerun it, you'll see where when it gets to the, the portion of drilling, it would pop right through. Let me go to 100%. Then from there, we kind of continue on within the program. So the next step, if we look at our sample, would be to mill in some counterboard holes. And this is always a challenge within a system, because generally I want to use a circular pocket clear, but normally on a circular pocket clear I'm not going to know the coordinates for each of these pockets in the bolt hole pattern. Well, what's kind of unique within Siemens is we allow you to treat any of the milling cycles just like drilling routines. So if you go over to milling and we physically come in and go into a pocket routine, I have an option where I can select either a single position or a pattern. So once I position it to a position pattern, now it's going to treat any of the milling cycles, whether it be rectangular or circular pockets, maybe boss cycles, any of these functions can be treated just like drilling routines. So in this case, we're going to come in and we're going to put a circular pocket. So I'm going to pick circular pocket. I'm going to tell it a cutter, the tool. So we're going to use the half-inch tool that we have. It happens to be down here in an unloaded state. So say OK. We'll define some feed rates. So on this tool, maybe I know that I want to run this at 2,000 per tooth at a surface footage of 550 surface feet. So we type in the surface footage. What's kind of interesting is once you put in the feed the surface footage or the feed per tooth, if you toggle them back, it will even show you what the calculated RPM and feed rate would be based on those conditions. So especially in surface footage, a lot of times we'll find that you're getting awfully close to your maximum RPM within the spindle. You can toggle it back and see what it's going to run at. From there, we define whether we're roughing, finishing, just finishing the wall maybe, putting a chamfer on it. We can then go down and define the cutter path. What we're used to in standard circular pockets is what we consider a plane-by-plane plane type of machining, and that was what we call centric. So in this case, it comes to some depth, clears it all out, moves down. But we also have another routine called helical. And what helical will do is it's also commonly called turbo milling, where it's going to do a helical cutter path all the way to the bottom depth. Then she'll pull out, move over whatever radial engagement I define, and then do the helical cutter path down again. So in this case, I'm going to do a helical cutter path. We'll do a pattern, because we're going to link it to 
the bolt hole pattern. We're going to give it a diameter. So I said this was a 750 diameter. Uh, the depth happened to be 315, so that's set. We can leave it. Same thing like we saw in the facing cycle. I can define my step over as a percentage of my cutter. Pitch would be per revolution of the helix. How far down do I want to go? So I'm going to go an eighth per rev. I'm kind of aggressive at it. Now I can leave a finished material to come back and do a finished cut after the fact, or I can just bring it right to size. I'm going to let this come right to size. Then my final question is, do I, am I going to completely machine it, or is there a hole already in it? Um, a scenario like this where the hole is only 3 eighths, I wouldn't bother telling it. But if you get a, an area where maybe there was a 1 inch or 2 inch hole and you're pocketing up to 4, it's kind of nice. It'll only machine where it needs to machine. It won't have to machine everything, all that dead space in the middle. So we hit accept. Now, this is another thing that's kind of unique to us. We're all kind of used to setting up a can cycle, telling it where to go, setting up a new can cycle, telling it where to go, and just kind of repeating those processes. We can certainly do that within this control. However, if you have a scenario where you're doing multiple operations in the same positions, you can chain all the cycles prior to the positions. So if I had a tap in this, I could put the tap cycle here, uh, reaming, whatever I happen to be doing, and just duplicating those positions. From there, if we jump over to simulation, I'm going to let it build up. and In this case, we'll see it face off, drill our holes, pocket our holes. There you see the, the little spiraled helix in. Now, I happen to have the show path function on. If you don't want to see it, you can toggle show path off and get a little clearer view of what the model looks like. You don't need show path on when you're verifying it. I like to use it because it gives you a good example of the cutter path you're going to achieve. Okay. So from there, we're going to come out of simulation, and we're going to do our regular shape. So if we look quickly at our print again, you see we have this non-irregular shape we want to mill. Um, where are we going to start? We can kind of start wherever you want. Um, we can start in a corner. We can start in the middle of a line. Um, a lot of guys get caught up with a scenario like this where Maybe the corner I want to start from isn't a true corner. There's some kind of blend, whether it be a chamfer or radius. You'll find within our control that's not an issue. So here we can come out and create that shape. So first thing I want to do is make sure my highlight is at the bottom of my bolt hole pattern. My vents will always be inserted below wherever the orange highlight is. So I can go over to Contour Mill. We can go to New Contour. And this allows us to describe the shape. Now, I'm going to give it some name for my own reference. I'm going to call this OD. Um, this allows you, if you have multiple shapes within a given program, to kind of be able to track them a little bit better. Now, you're going to define where the starting point is. So, lower left-hand corner, I'm going to happen to start from. Again, you can start from any corner or in the middle of any line. I'm going to start from 2 and 2. Hit Accept. So, then in here, in our Contour Editor, you're going to use these vertical soft keys to describe the shape. So if I'm in the lower left-hand corner, I want to climb mill around the part, my first move is going to be a vertical move in Y. I'm going to come up to a positive 2 inches. And then from there, I'm going to do a transition, whether it be a radius or a chamfer, to some other element that comes after this. So I'm doing a transitional of a radius of 5 eighths. I accept it. You see we get a, immediately get a drawing started for us. You're not going to see the radius yet in the line until I give it a new element. So now I'm moving over to the right in X, going over to X positive 2. When I get there, I happen to have a half inch chamfer, so I'm going to put it. So now I see the first two lines are created, and now I see my radius. I'm going to come down in Y to minus 2. Here we happen to have another chamfer of half an inch. Accept it. My final move will get me back to zero, so I'm gonna, or back to minus two, shall I say. And then when I get there, I know that I need a chamfer of half inch. So again, this is where I said that I can start and end at a corner. It'll automatically adjust the, the geometry if I have a radius or a chamfer there. Now what happened here on the left-hand side of the screen, if you happen to notice, is you have this little design tree, little arrows. That is stipulating every event or element that I created within the shape. So I can use this to start to edit features. You know, Maybe my lower chamfer of half inch was wrong. Well, I can arrow up to that field. 
and then I can arrow over with my little blue arrows here and come down and maybe tell it that, well, it was really a one inch chamfer. Now I see the chamfer immediately gets increased. So you'll use this, this design tree on your left side to kind of manage the shape as you, as you create it. So if you do make a mistake or if you need to add something into it later, you can do that. Once the shape is the way you want it, you're going to hit accept. Now the contour is created. So from there, we have three basic cutter paths that you can use on a, a given contour. I can do path milling, which allows me to mill around a profile. We can do pocket milling, which allows me to machine a regular pockets. I can have nested islands if I want. I believe we allow up to 99 islands within any pocket. We can do spigot cycles or boss where I can leave a feature standing. So in this case, I'm just going to do a basic path mill. So I'm going to jump over to path mill. We can either tell it the tool, or since tools are modal, we can leave it blank if we want. We can define a feed rate. There will be a surface footage, whether I'm roughing or finishing or putting a chamfer on it. Am I going to follow the direction the shape was drawn, or do I want to go backwards to it? In this case, I want to follow the direction. What side of the cutter path of the cutter is sitting on as far as the path? So this is your cutter comp left, cutter comp right, no cutter comp top of the stock, how thick is it, depth per pass, so maybe I'm going to take a quarter of an inch per pass. Am I leaving material for a finish cut in Z? No, but maybe I'll leave a little material for a finish cut in, in X and Y so you can see a finish cycle. How do I want to lead into the part? Do I want to do a simple straight line? Do I want to do a quarter circle or a semicircle? Or if I'm not using any cutter compensation, do I just follow the, the direction of the shape? So that would be more for like a slot milling type of routine. So in this case, I'm going to do, let's say, a quarter circle to lead in with a half inch radius. I can slow down my feed on my approach in Z, in case maybe I'm feeding into material. How do I retract out of it? I have the same number of options. And then where do I go when I'm done? Once the page is filled out, I hit accept. From here, I need to go back to path milling if I want to take that finished cut. We won't automatically take it. Gives you the ability of changing the tool. In this scenario, maybe I just want to drop my feed rate. Maybe increase my surface footage. I'm going to make sure that I change this to finish. From there, you'll notice when you go to finish, you are. Uh, let me go back to it. See how you have the, the finish amounts? They'll go away when you go to finish. Um, you can do multiple Z depths in the finish cycle if you wanted to. If I want to just go right to the final depth, I'll give it a depth equal to or greater than the amount of material coming off. I hit accept, and now I have the two cycles. Now, if you notice, it carried or retained all the information over. Um, this way, it kind of simplifies when you're, you are doing finishing cycles. You don't have to fill out the page entirely. All of our fields are what we call user-definable. So if you happen to like to use a feed rate of 10 inches a minute quite commonly, well, if you put it in the field once you've saved the event, the next time you come into this field, it will know that that was the last thing you used. So as you kind of get used to the control, it's going to speed up the programming process dramatically. From there, I can go to simulation. We can simulate it, see what's going to happen. And we'll go into a top view here. There's our counter bore. Now we're walking around the shape. And there's our finished cut. So at this point, we've got a pretty good representation of what's going to happen within the program. So if we come back over to our PowerPoint, we can now kind of talk about a little bit about automatic mode. So automatic is the next logical step. So I've created a part, I've simulated it, I like the cutter path, now I want to physically load a piece and, and run it. So within auto, you're going to go over to the automatic mode, it'll load it up. This gives you just a couple quick snapshots of the screens you're going to be seeing. So we see an absolute position window. When you start running it, distance ago will pop up. We'll see, naturally see, the events that you programmed. But if you want to see all of the, basically, the, the basic blocks or each physical line or arc move that the machine's going to make, then we can bring up a basic blocks option and see all those. As well, we can do simulation wall and run. This would be a concurrent simulation. So we'll take a look at that briefly. I can also start in the middle of a program. So we're going to try starting in the middle of the program just so you can kind of see how that mechanism works as well. And from there, we'll just segue briefly back over to auto. 
and continue moving on with the program process. So first things first, I want to be very aware of where my orange highlight is when I go to auto. So generally what you want to do is you want to always move your orange highlight to the top of the program. Then from there in the lower right hand corner I have the execute button. What execute will do is it will automatically put me into an auto mode. So you'll see the upper left hand corner will switch from job to auto. And then it will make sure it loads this part in memory. So I hit execute, switches to auto. I see my part is physically loaded. I'm ready at the top of my program. All I would have to do is hit cycle start. The machine would start to run that job. You'll see that my distance to go pops up. The highlight is going to show you at whatever cycle you're on. Again, if you want to see, you're a guy that likes to see every single move and what's coming up as well, you can turn on basic blocks as I maybe slow down the speed because I have it cranked up pretty good in simulation. I would see each of these blocks as the machine steps through the geometry. So you can utilize that functionality as well. Uh, we have parts counters and uh, time counters you can use so if you want to decrement your parts, whatnot, you can do that within here as well. I also mentioned we can bring up a concurrent verify. So you have the same button like you had over in, in the program mode, simulation, but now when I launch simulation and I hit cycle start, now it's going to be live to the operation. So you'll notice I crank my override down to zero. It's waiting for the computer to override, nothing's moving as I start to crank it up. You're going to start to see it's going to start to drill and mill our shape. So this would be exactly the way it would look right on the machine. We can toggle back out of it if we wanted to close it within the system. Now the final thing I, I mentioned I wanted to show you is how to start from the middle of the program or the middle of the, the part. It's actually quite simple. There's two ways to do it. But the first is the reason why I wanted to make sure my highlight was at the top of my program. Wherever you leave your highlight within the part program, once you go to execute, it's going to warn you and say, hey, it sounds like you want to start from that point. So this would be how you would typically start from the middle. Just leave your highlight to where you want to start. Now, an example like this, I left it on my bolt hole pattern. So the system automatically says, well, I understand that you have two different cycles for the bolt hole pattern. Which do you want to start from? Well, maybe I'll start from the circular pocket clear. Pick your circular pocket. Say OK. Then it'll be, well, which of the holes do you want to start from? Well, let's say I've already machined the first two and I stopped it for some reason. Lost an edge to the insert, cleared some chips. Well, now I can tell it, start from the third hole. So if this was a grid of 100 holes, I could start from my 50th hole if I wanted to. You say, OK. It's going to preset everything up. Follow cycle start. I hit cycle start initially. Then it's going to ask for a final cycle start. And it's going to start running that program for you from that point. Now whenever you start in the middle, it's always going to search up to that point, and that's the other way to do it, would be using the block search function. So here when I arrow down to a specific event with block search, I can say start search, maybe do the exact same field, and which one I want to start from. Waiting for its cycle start, I select cycle start, and NC start, and continues going from that point in time. Now, like I was saying, when you start in the middle, the system will scan to that point, set up any modal commands that it's going to need, whether it be spindle RPM, feed rate, cooling on. So it's, a, it's an intelligent start. Um, it's not like you always have to worry about starting from a tool change position because you might have some modal command that's not loaded. The system will automatically know when I'm starting from the middle of the, the given program. And with that being said, I'll jump back to the PowerPoint. That kind of resolves my section of the live demonstration, and I'm going to open it up for any potential questions that may have come in. Well, uh, this is Pete Zolinski again. We do have some questions. Um, let's just start with a simple one. Can you machine irregular pockets with this system? Yes, you can. Um, actually, if we go back into simulation, when we were uh, in the program mode, we'll just open up that program we're playing around with, under contour mill we had this, this pocket function. So that's where you would go to, to machine irregular pockets. So it's a matter of just linking just like I did before that irregular shape and it'll machine out that, that entire interior of the shape instead of just walking around the profile. There you can kind of see the animated element pop up. Well here's a question related to that. 
when machining irregular pockets, what happens if the tool is too big for a specific area? Ah, that's a good question. So basically what will happen here is the system has full tool detection and gouge detection. So that means that if I send a cutter into an area where it can't fit, it's not going to over machine it. Actually what it's going to do is it's going to leave the material for me to then go back with another tool and remove. Now with that being said, this is an option, but if you happen to have or have added this residual material function to the control, the system is smart enough to be able to take the smaller tool I gave it, figure out where the previous tool couldn't cut, and strictly cut at those portions. Um, if you don't have residual pocketing, you would then just kind of have to figure out how you're going to get back to those areas to remachine them. But what you really want to know is the fact that it will never overcut the geometry, so you're not going to scrap apart if you send a tool where it won't fit. Here is a question in a few sentences, so let me read this to you. Okay. When you were showing the demo in the shop mill program, you stated that the can cycles worked well in all planes. Correct. Do, does this work in the jog screen for using the probe in various planes to set up offsets? For example, if you have an angled head on a three-axis mill and you want a probe on the side of a part. Yes, yes, you can apply it either that or there's a, depending on the, the machine configuration, um, you may have also a, a swivel cycle. Um, I, don't, I don't have it, let me just see if I have it in this simulator, I don't. Normally there would be a swivel cycle here on like maybe a four or five axis machine um, and that would allow you to kind of tilt your work plane around as well. But yes, you can probe on multiple planes. Um, we've got various people asking about the availability of this presentation later, so let me just say that an, an email will go out to everyone attending here with a link to an, an archived version of this webinar that you could review again. Um, uh, one of the, the viewers asks, we have an 840 control. Are these mm -hmm. features available? Yes, the 840, 828, um, what we showed you today is the user interface side. So this is what's called Cinemark Operate. So Operate works on either an 840 or an 828. Um, the trick is, though, the system would have had to have been built with this software version. So if they have an older 840, um, they wouldn't most likely be able to upgrade to Operate. Um, but on a new purchase of a machine tool or something that was maybe purchased within just the last couple of years, most likely it would have this type of software. Um, simple question, can basic code be saved? Um, I, I'm wondering if they're referring to the basic blocks in auto? I think I would need more information on that. Um, the answer is I mean, yes. <laughs> the question okay. just said yes. Oh, oh, yes. Um, so as far as, no, as far as the basic block section is concerned, that's only for viewing. So you're, you're not able to go in and maybe edit or save those, those fields. Um, it's just showing you the resulting section of the code um, instead of being able to maybe edit the middle of a can cycle or something along those lines. So no. Um, this question asks, is there a way to zero an axis in relative without changing my work offset. So they want to, I'm assuming they want to just temporarily zero out an offset other than the work coordinate? Checking a depth. Uh, or you can do measure only. Um, so like, you know, given a, a probe section, if I want to check a field but I don't want to physically set an offset, if I, instead of do work offset, I do a measure only field with the probe. So like if I'm checking a depth and maybe I had the 3D probe in it, if I do a measure only, it'll give me the value, but it won't set it to an offset. I think that's probably what they're asking. Yeah, he added another comment. He's, he's using an indicator. Uh, same thing, measure only would, would kind of work in, in either selection or section. The only difference is if it's an indicator, it would work kind of like the edge finder did, so it would be a manual function. You wouldn't just hit cycle start and do it. But either way, yes, you can do measure only, and it will retain the data without setting it to an offset. Um, this person asks if the system is smart enough to know the configuration of our machine. That is, dual channel with two spindles, five axis head, and a lower turret. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Um, what will happen is as the machines get configured, the graphics will update around the type. So on a, on a twin channel machine, you'll actually be able to switch between the two channels. Um, what, they, what they mean when they say twin channel, um, I, I think other manufacturers call them paths, but basically it's like multiple turrets that can be running independent programs at the same time. Um, all that stuff can be supported within Operate. Uh, you can conversationally program both, both channels or paths if you want, um, and all the graphics will update to show that configuration of machine tool. Um, how can I machine on multiple vices? Oh, um, this is actually a, a great question. Um, what uh, what we have, it's kind of like one of those little best kept secrets within the system, but we have a little option under Program Manager that allows me to take a part program and tell it that maybe I want to machine it at, on multiple vices or multiple work clampings is another thing we call it. So like in this example, let's say we had that part that we just made and I said, okay, now I'm going to set this up for three different vices. Well, if I expand over, I get this option called multiple clamping. So multiple clamping allows me to say, well, how many vices am I going to have set up? So in this case, two. What is my first work offset or first vice position? And what do I want to call the program when I'm done? So you give it some name. I'm just going to call it number one. Then from there, I come in and I select the program that I want to physically run at each of those vices. So I'm going to select on all clampings in this case, the, that one part program. And by doing that, it will actually create a new part program for me that will manage the two different, two different vices. So now this one simple simple scenario took a program and optimized its tools so it'll bounce between devices without duplicate tool changes all for me automatically. Uh, one of the viewers is asking you to discuss um, running large programs from USB. Sure. Um, basically the way it works is if I have a file that can't fit in the system memory, I do certainly have the option of running it from a remote device. Um, if I had a USB physically plugged into my system here, you would see the USB would highlight. Same thing with logical drive. Um, so like let's say a logical drive, I'll show you in this scenario. You'd come into maybe a given folder. So maybe I have a, an example here. I come over to a part program. So maybe I'm going to do this simple part program. Um, and then from there, I can just do the execute feature, and it'll load and run and run it. Now, the only thing I warn you with from the USB side, USB tends to be a little finicky. Um, one, there's a, a lot of low-cost USB devices floating around out there. Um, tend to be not the most reliable of devices, like you know the USB you maybe got at your bank um, for opening a free bank account, you know that kind of deal. Um, the other inherent problem with USB is it's not a great connection. Um, you know, it's just a pressure-sensitive connection. So we don't necessarily recommend making it a standard process to run from the USB all the time. Um, you, you could experience intermittent lockups, um, potentially from a, a low-cost device. Guys that do want to run from the USB, I, I do stress, get a good quality device, uh, like, a, like a SanDisk type name brand component, and just be concerned about you know, plugging that thing in or out. Last thing you want anybody to do is bump it while it's in the middle of a program. Probably the, the better path, if you are going to run, larger files on a consistent basis would be do it from a network drive. Um, the file can stay on the network the whole time. It doesn't have to be loaded to memory. It's a matter of just like you see here, pick it, execute, and cycle, start, and go. Um, network is a much more robust connection than you'll find with USB. What about running an NC program by DNC? There's a question about that as well. Okay. Um, basically, DNC is obsoleted. Um, what happens is um, our system has an automatic rotary buffer. So what will happen is once the file exceeds the memory buffer size, the system will automatically take parts of pieces of the file and dump it into memory without you doing anything additional. So the days of having to you know, set up DNC, set a program up to send, set the system up to receive, have the whole thing interlinked, um, you don't have to do any of that functionality. Um, the system's intelligent enough to realize once the file doesn't fit in the part program memory, it'll automatically take it as it needs it. 
can you import a DXF file into the contour or pocketing routines? You can. Um, basically, the way it works, if you want to do any type of DFX, DFX functionality, XF functionality, um, what you need to do is um, you get a piece of offline software that allows you to take the, the DXF file and just translates it into our own format. So once you do that and you bring it over to the machine, then you can open it up in the contour editor. You could edit it at the system if you wanted to and then attach it to whatever the cutter path function that you would want, the profile or the pocket, and then run it from there. Can I simulate any program stored in memory? Yes. Yes, simulation is not dependent to conversational. Simulation will work on any standard G code files as well. Um, let's see. Is the Siemens control capable of tool life management? And if so, it is. is it an option? Uh, it, it is not an option. Um, I touched upon it really, really briefly earlier, but just to talk about it real quick, you know, let's say for argument's sake we had created this cutter number one and we wanted to do some tool life management on it. So what I can do is I can create a new tool and we'll just new spot. And what you do is you create a tool with the exact same name. So once I create another one, see how my ST field which is what we call sister tools, now indexes to number two. Immediately these two tools are associated. So now wherever I tell it to, to use the one, it will allow the other one to work within. So from there, once the tools are associated, you just set up a life under the where. And it's a matter of just coming into where, toggling, whether I'm going to decrement my life based on time, quantity of parts, or input where field. Once the tool gets used up, It'll get flagged just like that. The system will automatically search for a duplicate name within the system and then switch to that tool and continue cutting. Uh, I've got a couple more questions here. Can right. you tap with your conversational mode? Yes. Um, when we were inside the program, let me jump back to it real fast, and we were over in drilling. We talked about it briefly. It gets a little confusing because we call it threading, but threading applies to tapping. So within the tapping function, you can do basic tapping. Uh, can be rigid or soft tapping. When you're doing rigid, you can do a single tap, chip breaker, or chip removal. So you can do peck tapping as well as standard tapping. And one more. Do you support engraving at the control, or does it have to be programmed with a CAM system? Okay, the engraving cycle is right at the system. Um, if I jump over to milling, I can go into engraving. From here I can type any text I want. Um, we are limited to only one style font, but we do support uppercase and lowercase letters. We also support special characters as well, so you can do some more unique characters as well as anything supported on your keyboard. Um, within the engraving, we also have a variable engraving. So if you're doing uh, serial numbers and you want the system to automatically decrement up the serial number, you can do that. We can do date and time stamping. So when I do the time, every time the cycle, program cycle runs and gets to the engraving cycle, it'll update and engrave that physical time of that time. So you can do quite a bit of engraving at the, on the system. Well, all right, that will do it. I want to thank everyone for joining us. This uh, completes uh, the webinar from Siemens. This webinar has been recorded, as I say, and a link uh, to the recorded version will be emailed to you in a few days. Thank you to Siemens for providing this information today, and, and thank all of you for giving this presentation your attention. Have a great day.